CEO of Pfizer, Albert Borla, along with our own Meg Terrell. Meg? Well, Kelly, thanks so much. And Albert, thanks for being here. You know, you reported Q1 results this morning. And let's start right there with what Kelly mentioned about Jim's comments this morning about sort of the head scratching reaction from your stock um, to the results, not just the COVID vaccine, which of course is blowing expectations out of the water. You forecast now $26 billion in sales this year. You're forecasting durable revenue from the vaccine like a flu-like market. You developed it in record time during a pandemic and you grew the rest of the business 8% during the first quarter. And yet your stock is flat today uh, and only up about 8% year to date. What do you think is not resonating with Wall Street right now in terms of your business when you look in the face of everything that you have just done? Meg, when it comes to stock, uh, I think that uh, this is not a sprint. It's a marathon. And uh, actually, this is not my own uh, quote. Uh, this is the advice that uh, Ian Reid gave me when I took over. And what I know it is that you need to have to do the right things. You need to have operational performance. And... Uh, the stock price will follow. So right now, I'm really focusing on creating more vaccines, producing more vaccines for the world, distributing them safely, making sure that we will be ready for the next pandemic, making sure that we will be ready for the variants that may escape the protection of our vaccine, and of course, investing in R&D. Well, let's talk about vaccinating the world. You know, Pfizer has said you've got manufacturing capacity for up to 2.5 billion doses in 2021. You've struck agreements for 1.6 billion doses. Help us think about how to think about that capacity that's not accounted for right now, 900 million doses. Um, if, if countries don't strike deals for those doses, what do you think is the right thing to do in order to supply the world? Should rich countries buy them and donate them? Uh, is there an agreement that could be worked out with COVAX, the, the World Health Organization facility? How do you think about the best way to supply your vaccine to the world this year? Well, those doses, which are at least 2.5 billion this year and will be 3 billion uh, next year, are for the whole world. And price should not be an obstacle because we are giving these doses at tier pricing. The rich countries, the high-income countries like the US, Europe, Japan, Canada, Australia, they are paying one tier. The middle-income countries, they are paying half of this price. And the low-income countries, they are offered these doses at cost. So right now, the price is not going to be the obstacle. We need to make sure that we have enough production for all. And uh, this is why we keep investing. And this is why I feel very comfortable that we have these numbers for several reasons. One, it is that uh, we are having distribution net manufacturing networks across the world. So for every stage of our manufacturing process, I have at least two or three manufacturing sites that are doing it. So even if something goes wrong in one, the others could uh, step in. The second is that right now our yields, our processes are so effective that we keep increasing the production. And the third is that our quality controls are so good that we haven't rejected any single batch so far or let's say, I think, 1 million doses wow. out of 425 million doses that we produced, that we're able to, to, to release. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm very confident that uh, we will have enough doses. It's just coming in the next few months. Mr. Borla, it's Kelly here, and, and thanks for joining us. What does the experiences in India and Brazil tell you about the efficacy of the vaccines and our bodies in general, the antibodies in fighting COVID. You know, there's a lot of speculation right now that these resistance levels should be much higher am among the population than they are. Does that mean it's because of the variants that we're susceptible to maybe getting it again, or that if people had resistance from being exposed or even from the vaccine, they still could get it again? How frequently do you think we're going to need booster shots or annual? I mean, is annual even frequently enough at this point? What's your latest thinking about this? First, let's say that we should be looking at the data. And uh, with all the data I have collected so far, there is no variant that we have identified that escapes the protection of our vaccine. Even the South African that has been, uh, uh, let's say, uh, being the one that it is the most challenging one, uh, our studies in South Africa demonstrated 100% uh, efficacy. And we know that it was not easy for all vaccines to demonstrate efficacy there. But nevertheless, we are working on new variants, and uh, because the possibility that one of them will eventually evade the protection of our vaccine is there. So we are developing right now, uh, we have developed a variant for the South African uh, uh, mutant, but it is in the clinic and we are going to see uh, if we need a specific vaccine or not. 
but uh, VAT will also be used as a regulatory pathway. What we want to do it is to make sure that if a single variant is identified that it is escaping the protection of our vaccine, we will be ready within 100 days from that day to be able to have quantities manufactured and the files submitted to regulatory authority. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.